Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to another Read With Me session. I'm yours truly, Isabel Bedell, and I'm here to read with you another episode. Now, we've been reading so many books this year that I'm literally using books as my mic stand. What a glorious victory. And speaking of victory, the last chapter was all about the law of victory. And we learned how Michael Jordan was actually one of the key players in making the law of victory so well known in the world, which is quite remarkable if you think about it. Also, today, we will be going over the law of the big mo, big mo. Momentum is a leader's best friend. And if you are ready to bring in the momentum into your life, this is the chapter that will change the course of your momentum, the course of your direction, and will instill in you the energy needed to increase the law of Big Mo. So let's get into it. Super excited. It's law of Big Mo, which is Law number 16 out of the 21 laws. We're almost done with this book. Let's get it. The Law of Big Mo. Momentum is a leader's best friend. If you got all the passion, tools, and people you need to fulfill a great vision, yet you can't seem to get your organization moving and going in the right direction, you're dead in the water as a leader. If you can't get things going, you will not succeed. What do you need in such circumstances? You need to look at the law of Big Mo and harness the power of the leader's best friend. Momentum. Momentum. Starting from scratch. If ever there was a person with talent and vision, it was Ed Catmull. As a boy, Catmull had grown up wanting to become an animator and filmmaker. But he went to college. He had a realization he wasn't good enough. He promptly changed his focus to physics and computer science, earning a bachelor's degree in each during in a bachelor's degree in each during the next four years. And after working for Boeing a few years, he decided on a gra on graduate school and enrolled in a new field within computer science, computer graphics. There he discovered that he could draw with the aid of a computer. It rekindled his dream to make movies. And even before he earned his PhD in 1974, Catmull was developing innovative software and looking for opportunities to take to make computer generated movies. In 1979, filmmaker George Lucas hired Catmull to run the computer graphics division of Lucasfilm LTD Limited. For the next seven years, Catmull hired some of the best technicians in the country and attracted other talents such as Lo John Lasseter, who had once worked at Disney. Catmull groups, Catmull's group broke new ground technologically and produced some incredible work such as the Genesis sequence in Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, However, the division was very expensive to keep running. Catmull tried to convince Lucas to let him try to make computer-generated future films, but the technology was still in its early stages and it was too expensive. And instead, Lucas decided to sell the division. In 1986, Steve Jobs bought it, paying $5 million for it and putting an additional $5 million into the company. He named it Pixar. Wow. Talk about a strategic buyer. Baby steps. While it was struggling to become profitable, Pixar began making short films to demonstrate the power of its technology. The first was called Luxo Jr. It shows two animated desk lamps interacting as a parent and child would. Typically in those days, after showing any kind of film demonstration, computer animation, filmmakers were asked a bunch of technical questions by industry experts who watched the film and about algorithms they wrote on the software they used. And Catmull and Lesseter knew they had made a significant step forward when one of the first questions was asked whether the parent lamp was the mother or the father. 
And that's when they knew they had connected with their audience and succeeded in telling a story, not just showing off new technology. Lasseter says, we had absolutely no money, no computers, no people, no time to do the fancy flying camera moves that you were all seeing and all the glitzy tracing and all that stuff. We just had no time. We just locked the camera down and had no background, but it made the audience focus on what was important in the film, the story and the characters. That's what mattered. So for the first time, this film was entertaining people because it was made with computer animation. Luxo Jr. was so good that it, not, it was nominated for an Academy Award, but Catmull and his team were still a long way from achieving his dream of creating a full-length feature film. The company's greatest challenge at the time was merely surviving, and Pixar continued to develop technology. The company also gained recognition and received awards including its first Oscar in 1989. And to help make ends, the team started to make computer animated commercials. You may remember a commercial with a Listerine bottle boxing. That was Pixar's work. But it was difficult for Pixar to gain significant momentum. The firm was moving forward, but only very slowly. Finally, some credibility. Then, in 1991, because of the credibility Pixar had earned, it got a significant break. The leaders thought the company was ready to take the next big step, creating a one-hour television special. Lasseter approached Disney, his former employer, to pitch the idea. The response amazed him. Disney offered Pixar a contract to create three full-length feature movies using computer animation, and Disney would fund and distribute the projects. Pixar would create them and receive a percentage of the profits. Fantastic. Pixar finally had an opportunity to fulfill Catmull's vision, but the company was still far from realizing it. The company got to work on what would become Toy Story, but the team had trouble with the characters and the story. Disney pushed Lasseter to make the characters more edgy, but they were becoming more unlikable. And after two years of work, Disney's chief of animation told them, guys, no matter how much you try to fix it, it's just not working. Lasseter begged Disney not to pull the plug and give them one more chance to work things out. We called all hands on deck, stayed up all night, and redid the whole first act of Toy Story within two weeks. When we showed it back to Disney, they were stunned. The work on Toy Story moved forward. It would take Pixar four years to make the movie. And meanwhile, other studios were using the technology developed by Catmull and his team and were producing movies like Jurassic Park and Terminator 2. It was kind of frustrating for us, says Catmull, because we were busy making this movie for Disney and everybody was taking credit for these other films. But we, were the ones who wrote the software for them. Though the rest of the world wasn't seeing it yet, Pixar was starting to develop momentum. That, become obvious, that became obvious to everyone when Toy Story opened in November 1995, when the contract with Disney was signed four years earlier. Pixar CEO Steve Jobs estimated that if the first movie was a modest hit, say $75 million in the box office, we'll both break even. And if it gets $100 million, we'll both make money. But if it's a real blockbuster and it earns $200 million or so in the box office, then we'll make good money and Disney will make a lot of money. Few people could have predicted that it would make a hundred and 92 million domestically and 362 million worldwide. And from that time, Pixar's momentum had been strong and if anything had continued to grow. The organization had won 17 Oscars and been awarded 42 patents. And since Toy Story came out, the company had produced hit after hit after hit. A Bug's Life, Toy Story 2, Monsters Inc., Finding Nemo, The Incredible, and Cars. Worldwide, these movies have earned more than $3.67 billion. Wow. If you're a 1990s baby, you know this was a significant moment in your life. Bugs Life, Toy Story 2, Toy Story, Monsters, Inc., Finding Nemo, The Incredibles, and Cars? Psh, forget about it. Rolling in dough. Turn about. 
Ironically, while Pixar was gaining momentum, Disney, the company who helped to create its breakthrough, was losing momentum. Disney's animation division had fallen on hard times. Its last significant animated movie was Lilo and Stitch in 2002, and it had produced three highly expensive bombs, Atlantis, Treasure Planet, and Home of the Range. How could Disney possibly regain its momentum? Bob Iger, who became Disney's president and CEO in October 2005, knew how. He purchased Pixar. Now, the people Disney once helped were helping Disney. Catmull became a Disney's president of feature animation, and Lasseter made was made chief of creative officer. Disney had has had two major hurt heydays. Catmull says we're going to make a third. And what about Pixar? Well, it will continue to function as before under the care of Catmull and Lasseter. And when you've got great momentum, you don't just want to do anything to get it in its way. After all, momentum is a leader's best friend. When you've got momentum, you don't want to do anything to get in its way. Momentum is a leader's best friend. Truths about momentum. Why do I say that momentum really is a leader's best friend? Well, because many times it's the only thing that makes the difference between losing and winning. When you have no momentum, even the simplest tasks seem impossible. Small problems look like insurmountable obstacles. Morale becomes low. The future appears dark. An organization with no momentum is like a train at a dead stop. It's hard to get it going. And even small wooden blocks on the track could keep it from going anywhere. On the other hand, when you have momentum on your side, the future looks bright, obstacles appear small, and troubles seem inconsequential. An organization with momentum is like a train that's moving at 60 miles per hour. You could build a steel reinforced concrete wall across the tracks and the train would plow right through it. And if you want your organization, department, or team to succeed, you must learn the law of momentum and make the most of it in your organization. Here are some things about momentum that you must know. Number one, momentum is the great exaggerator. The law of Big Mo at work is easily seen in sports because the swing, the swings in momentum occur in the space of a few hours right before your eyes. And when a team gets on a roll, every play seems to work. Every shot seems to score. The team seems to do no wrong. And the opposite is also true. When a team is in a slump, no matter how hard you work or how many solutions you try, nothing seems to work. Momentum is like a magnifying glass. It makes things look bigger than what they really are. That's why I call it the great exaggerator. Hmm. And it's one of the reasons that leaders work so hard to control momentum, because momentum has such a great impact, leaders try to control it. And that's why in basketball games, for instance, when the opposing team is scoring a lot of unanswered points and starts to develop momentum, a good coach will call a timeout. Why? He's trying to stop the other team's momentum before it becomes too, so strong. If he doesn't, his team will likely lose the game. When was the last time that you heard a team on the cusp of winning a championship complain about injuries or second guess the team's ability or totally rethink strategy? It doesn't happen. Is that because no one is injured and everything is perfect? No, it's because success is exaggerated by momentum. When you have momentum, you don't worry about small problems and many larger ones seem to work themselves out. Number two, momentum makes leaders look better than they are. When leaders have momentum on their side, people think that they are geniuses. They look past shortcomings. They forget about the mistakes the leaders have made. Momentum has changes everyone's perspective of leaders, and people like associating themselves with winners. Young leaders often get less credit than they deserve and often encourage younger leaders just not to lose heart. When leaders are new in their careers, they don't have any momentum yet and others often give them any credit. Experienced leaders think that the younger ones don't know anything, and one of the reasons John Lasseter was pushed out of Disney was that he had a lot of ideas, and the executives at Disney who had been second-tier animators under the best filmmakers wanted him to pay his dues. 
Lasseter recalls one executive telling him, shut up and do your work for the next 20 years and then maybe we'll listen to you. That's a terrible line to say to anyone. He knew he was better than that. Once a leader creates some success for his organization and develops career momentum, then people give him more credit than he deserves. Why? Well, because of the law of the big mo. Momentum exaggerates the leader's success and makes him look better than he really is. It may not seem fair, but that's just the way it works. And for many years, I have tried to add value to people, often writing 50 books and hundreds of lessons on leadership and success. I have gained a lot of momentum. And everything I do is to add value to people that seems to be compounding in a positive way. Often I say that when I started my career, I wasn't as bad as people thought. And today I'm not as good as people give me credit for. Why the difference? It's momentum. Momentum. Number three, momentum helps followers perform better than they are. When leadership is strong and there's momentum in an organization, people are motivated and inspired to perform at higher levels. They become effective beyond their hopes and expectations. And if you remember the 1980 U.S. Olympic hockey team, you know what I'm talking about. The team was good but not good enough to win the gold medal. Yet, that's what the Americans did. Why? Because leading up to the championship game, they won game after game after game and against very tough teams. They gained so much momentum that they performed beyond everyone's expectations. And after they beat the Russians, nothing, nothing could stop them from coming home with the gold medal. That's the same kind of thing that is true in business and volunteer organizations. When an organization has momentum, all participants are more successful than they would be otherwise. I'll tell you now how you know that's true. If you see leaders, especially mid-level ones, who had great success in their organization with momentum, leave the organization and suddenly their performance becomes merely average. You know the law of Big Mo was at work. Even average people can perform far above average in an organization with great momentum. Here's number four. Momentum is easier to steer than to start. Have you ever been water skiing? And if you have, you know that it's harder to get up on the water than it is to steer once you're up there. Think about the first time that you skied. Before you got, you got up, the boat was dragging you along and you probably thought your arms were going to give away as the water flooded against your chest and into your face. And for a moment, you might have believed you couldn't hold on to the tow rope any longer. But then the force of the water drove into your skis into the surface and off you went. At that point, you were able to make a turn with only a subtle shift of weight from one foot to another. And that's the way the momentum of a leadership works. Getting started is a struggle, but once you're moving... Getting started is a struggle, but once you get moving, you can really start to do some amazing, amazing things. Number five, momentum is the most powerful change agent. The story of Pixar is a classic example of the power of momentum. It changed the organization from an underfunded and understaffed organization scraping to survive into an entertainment powerhouse. During the early days before it had momentum, the company considered becoming a provider of hardware to medical companies so it could store and access MRI via computers. And if that would have happened, the organization would have lost its most talented and productive people. Instead, it transformed into an organization that is teaching Disney, the father of animated movies, how to regain its former glory. And giving enough momentum, nearly any kind of change is possible in an organization. People like to get on a winning bandwagon. People like to get on a winning bandwagon. Followers trust leaders who have a proven track record. They accept changes from people who have led them to victory before. And momentum picks victory within reach. Number six, momentum is the leader's responsibility. It takes a leader to create momentum. Followers can catch it. Good managers are able to use it to their advantage once it's begun. And everyone can enjoy the benefits it brings. But creating momentum requires someone who has vision, can assemble a good team, and motivates others.
if the leader is good, if the if the leader is looking for someone to motivate him or her, then the organization is in trouble. If the leader is waiting for the organization to develop momentum on its own, then the organization is in trouble. If the leader's responsibility is to initiate momentum and keep it going, U.S. President Harry Truman once said, if you can't stand the heat, get out the kitchen. But for leaders, that statement should be changed to, if you can't make some heat, get out of the kitchen. If you can't make some heat, get out the kitchen. If you can't make some heat, get out of the kitchen. Love that line. Momentum begins inside the leader. This is number seven. Momentum begins within the individual leader. It starts with the vision, passion, and enthusiasm. It starts with energy. Inspirational writer Eleanor Doan observed, you cannot kindle a fire in any other heart until it is burning within your own. Mm. If you don't believe in the vision and enthusiastically pursue it, doing all that you can to bring it to fruition, then you won't start making the small gains required to get the ball rolling. And however, if you model enthusiasm to, to your people day in and day out, you attract like-minded people to your team, department, organization, and motivate them to achieve. You will begin to see forward progress. And once you do, you will be able to begin to generate momentum. And if you're wise, you'll value it for what it is the leader's best friend. Once you have it, you can do almost anything. And that's the power of Big Mo. Moving the immovable. Of all the leaders that I meet, the ones who become the most frustrated are those who try to make progress and develop momentum in bureaucratic organizations. In those organizations, people are often making time. They're, they've given up and they either don't want to change or don't believe it's possible. Several years ago, I saw a movie called Stand and Deliver that illustrates the hopelessness many people feel in an organization without momentum. Maybe you've seen it too. It's about a real life teacher named Jane, Jamie Escalante, who worked at Garfield High School in Los Angeles, California. Teaching, motivating, and leading were in Jamie's blood, even from the time of his youth in native Bolivia. He quickly became known at his city's finest teacher, as the city's finest teacher, when he, when he was in his 30s, Escalante and his family immigrated to the United States. He worked several years in the restaurant and then at Russell Electronics. Though he could have pursued a promising career at Russell, he went back to school, earned his second bachelor's degree so that he could teach in the United States. Escalante's burning desire was to make a difference in people's lives. And at the age of 43, he was hired by Garfield High School to teach computer science. And when he arrived at Garfield on the first day of class, he found that there was no funding for computers. And because his degree was in mathematics, he, he would be teaching basic math. Disappointed, he went in search for his first class, hoping that his dream of making a difference wasn't slipping through his fingers, fighting a tidal wave of negative momentum. The change from computers to math turned out to be the least of Escalante's problems. The school was the school which had been empty and quiet and quiet during the summer time interview was now in chaos. Discipline was non-existent. Fights seemed to break out continuously. Trash and graffiti were everywhere. Students and even outsiders from the neighborhood roamed all over the campus throughout the day. Gang activity was rampant and it was a teacher's worst nightmare. Almost daily he thought of quitting. But his passion of teaching and his dedication to improving the lives of students wouldn't allow him to give up yet. Yet, at the same time, Escalante was enough of a leader to know that the students were doomed if the school didn't change. They were all sliding backward fast and they needed something to move them forward. When a new principal was brought in, things began to change for the better, but Escalante wanted to make it further. He believed that the way to improve the school was to challenge the school's best and brightest with a calculus class. That would prepare them for an AP class, earning them college credits. A few AP tests were already being given on campus in Spanish, and occasionally an individual student would attempt a test in physics or, or, his, or history. But the problem was that the school didn't even have a leader with a vision to take up the cause, and there was Escalante's came into play. 
small beginnings. In the fall of 1978, Escalante's organization, the first calculus class, rounding up every possible candidate who might be able to handle the course of Garfield's 3,500 students, he was able to find only 14 students. And in the first few classes, he laid out the work it, it would take for them to prepare for the AP calculus test at the end of the year. And by the end of the second week of school, he had lost seven students. And even the ones who stayed were not well prepared for calculus. And by late spring, he was down to only five students. All of them took the AP test in May, but only two passed. Escalante was disappointed, but he refused to give up, especially since he had made some progress. He knew that if he could help his students experience a few wins, build their confidence and give them hope, he could move them forward. And he was determined to do whatever it took. So it, to motivate them, he'd given them extra homework or challenge one of the school's athletes to a handball match. Escalante never lost. And if they needed encouragement, he'd take them out to McDonald's as a reward. If they got lazy, he'd inspire, amaze, amuse, and even intimidate them. And all along the way, he models hard work, dedication to excellence. And when he and what he calls ganas, desire. It all starts with a little progress, okay? It all starts with a little progress. The next fall, Escalante put together another calculus class, this time with nine students. And at the time, and at the end of the year, eight took the test and six passed. He was making progress, word of the success spread. Students heard that Escalante's protégés were all earning college credits. And in the fall of 1980, his calculus class numbered 15. When they all took the test at the end of the year, 14 students passed. The steps forward weren't huge, but Escalante could see that the program was building momentum. The next group of students numbering 18 was the subject of movie Stand and Deliver, like the predecessors. They worked very hard to learn calculus, many coming into school at 7 a.m. every day, full hour and half hour before school started. And often they stayed until 5, 6, or even 7 p.m. And though educational testing services questioned the validity of the first test the students took, they had to take it a second time and 100% of them passed. And after that, the math program exploded. In 1983, the number of students passing the AP calculus exam almost doubled from 18 to 31. The next year, it doubled again, the number reaching 63, and it continued growing. In 1987, 129 students took the test with 85 of them receiving college credits. Garfield High School in East Los Angeles was considered the sinkhole of this district, producing 27% of all passing AP calculus stores by Mexican Americans in the entire United States. The momentum explosion. The benefits of the law, Big Mo, were felt by all of Garfield High School students. The school started offering classes to prepare students for the other AP exams. And in time, Garfield held regular AP classes in Spanish, calculus, history, European history, biology, physics, French government, and even computer science. In 1987, nine years after Escalante spearheaded the program, Garfield students took more than 325 AP examinations. Most incredibly, Garfield had a waiting list of over more than 400 students from areas outside of its boundaries waiting to enroll. The school was once the laughing stock of the district and had almost lost its accreditation had become one of the top three inner city schools in the entire nation. And that's the power of the law of Big Mo. Look, I found a dollar in here. That's awesome. Here is where you apply the law of Big Mo in your life. Number one, momentum begins inside of the leader and spreads from there. Have you taken responsibility for the momentum in the area of which you are the leader? Are you passionate about the vision? Do you display enthusiasm at all times? Do you work to motivate others even when they don't feel like it? You must model that attitude and work ethic and, and work ethic that you would like to see in others. And that often requires what I call character leadership. Number two, motivation is a key factor in developing momentum. The first step toward building mo motivation is removing demotivating elements within the organization and what in your area of responsibility is causing people to lose their passion and enthusiasm how can you go out about removing or at least minimizing these factors once you have done that you can take the next step which is to identify and put into play specific elements that will motivate your followers 
And number three, lastly, to encourage momentum, you need to help your people celebrate their accomplishments. Make it a regular practice to honor people who move the ball forward. You want to continually praise effort, but reward accomplishments. The more that you reward success, the more people will strive for it. There you go. That is the law of Big Mo. Now I'm going to get into the law of Big Mo in a meeting that we have. And I hope, I hope that that chapter just motivate you into momentum. Let's do this. Talk to you soon. Have a blessed day.